All right. So welcome to J Village Learn, our Refining Your Technique series. Today we're going to talk about website best practices. Uh, if you have a question for us, my colleague Jean Elizabeth, uh, project manager here at J Village, will be monitoring the chat line. And uh, that's the little thought balloon in the control panel at the top of your screen. Um, okay. And with that, we'll get started talking about best practices. So the first question is, let's, let's define what a best practice is. And I pulled this from Wikipedia. Um, and Wikipedia is good for some things, but not for others. But I rather like the way this was phrased, that a best practice is being a method or technique that has consistently shown results, basically things that work. Uh, and uh, most often that's backed up by various studies. Sometimes it's empirical. Sometimes it's obvious. But uh, in, in general, we use the term best practices uh, to indicate things that uh, we know or we're pretty confident that will work well on your website or any other place. And the important uh, qualifier there is that best practices uh, are malleable. Uh, as technologies progress and things changes, and, and a great example uh, in, in the world of websites is that, uh, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, there weren't many people looking at websites on mobile devices. Uh, recent, more recently, statistics indicate that more than half of the browsing that goes on on the Internet is through mobile devices. And mobile devices have small screens, and that has an impact on the way your website uh, looks, the way your website is accessed, because clicking from a mouse is much different than uh, touching, a, touching a screen. Um, so this is kind of our working definition of best practice. And I'm going to cover a bunch of different topics today. Um, I'll touch on each of these. This, uh, if, if you've been to the accessibility webinar that I presented a while back, you're going to hear some similar themes because uh, what is good from an accessibility standpoint tends to be good for everybody, and also it's all about usability. So we'll get started. And one of the first things I'm going to talk about um, is, is talking about planning a website. And, uh, you know, because a website is, is not a one-time project for the very reason that I just stated, the Internet is evolving, the way people access the Internet is changing, uh, and we want to keep up with that, uh, both uh, here at J Village and what we uh, help you with in terms of the features for your website and building or refreshing your website. Uh, the fact is, everything is, is moving towards mobile design. And uh, we're starting to adopt that as well in our new builds. It's a uh, principle called Mobile First, where rather than uh, designing a website uh, to be presented on a computer monitor, we are paying very close attention to how a website is displayed on a mobile device. Because as I said, more than half the browsing going on in the Internet right now is on mobile devices. So for the very reason that things do change, uh, sometimes rapidly, you really should plan to refresh your site uh, every three years or so. And, and that, that can be anything from uh, fine-tuning your website, uh, uh, enhancing perhaps the responsive design of your website so that it uh, works as, as good as well as possible on mobile devices, maybe even creating a mobile version of your website. Um, so but it should be done on a fairly routine basis. And, and above all, you should have a strategy of, of what it is you want to do with your website. Um, now, because a lot of you have, some of you just have one person working on your website, some of you have many people working on your website. But really, in any organization, uh, you need to develop a strategy, and that's got to be a, a team approach. Uh, it's, it's difficult enough to have separate uh, departments or functions within an organization uh, working together organizationally, and it, it shouldn't be obvious on your website that, that very different uh, people are at work on different parts of the website. One of the best practices for a website is consistency. Uh, you should also be including strategies for using and linking social media. This is, again, increasingly important in today's world. Everybody is making heavy use of social media. And don't ignore the back end in your plan. And when I say that, I mean 
those of you who are doing content editing through the back end, you've got a, a file browser back there, and um, it's a great idea to bring some organization to the extent you can to the arrangement of uh, content in, in your back end. Uh, we do have a new file management tool that we are making available um, that really enhances uh, the ability to move files around in the back end and so on. Um, at this point, it is an optional, uh, and you can certainly give us a call and we can tell you more about that. Uh, but again, planning is, is critical and developing that strategy uh, to help you guide what it is you want to do, what you want to get out of your website, what your goals are for your website, and that should be a shared vision. So now I'll get a little, into the little more nitty gritty. Uh, I'm going to talk about page layout. And you know, the goal, of a, uh, the goal of our platform and the platform we provide you for building your websites uh, is that uh, we make consistent layout easy for you. Uh, when you define the various elements of your site, uh, sidebars, menus, and so on, we make it very. We try to make it very easy for you, and we help make you consistent across your website. Uh, again, uh, since the internet is changing, uh, you need to be considerate of different screen sizes. Um, is this because we know now that pages are going to be displayed on tablets and on smartphones and so on. And that can have implications uh, for the layout and design uh, of your pages, uh, whether it's font size, uh, the size and uh, positioning of images, and, and so on and so forth. And a good way to look at your own website, uh, if you can do this, is, is sort of climb out of your, your editor mode uh, or get somebody else. And, and notice when you open a web page how your eye travels around the page. And that can be very telling. Um, another element of uh, page layout, of course, is using quick links effectively if you use them. There are some things uh, that may not quite belong in your main navigation, but you still want be able to, people to be able to get to certain parts of your website. And quick links are a good tool for that. Again, sidebars, and, and this again becomes important, uh, again, from a, a presentation perspective as well as a small screen perspective. You want to keep your sidebar content simple, not necessarily distracting, because especially on, uh, on your interior page, your goal is to present the content on the page. And your sidebar should not be so distracting that it draws the eye away from the content of the page. Now, we're not necessarily talking about everything being strict and rigid, um, but again, uh, a level of consistency is important. Um, within a page, your information should flow, and uh, we'll get a little more into that when I talk about uh, how we organize uh, a page. Uh, I'm going to make some comments, some general comments about content. Um, and you know it may seem self-evident, but it's not always done this way. The most important information should be the first information or the most easily seen information on your page. And generally, that means putting it at the top. Um, using simple language is, is very important. And uh, one of the things uh, I suggest is that you choose a jar jargon judge, especially if, if you're someone like me who is a techie and has a tendency to talk in complicated technical terms. Uh, I, try my, I pride myself on trying to be sort of a geek interpreter, and that is uh, you know, reducing all this jargon and complexity to very simple language. Because if you consider your audience, uh, very, very many of them are not like some of us. Um, and we want to make our sites universally accessible and understandable. You want to be consistent with text styles and formatting. You're going to hear this from us again and again and again, um, that it is important to have consistency throughout your website using the same text fonts. And again, this is something that we uh, tend try, try to enforce uh, by, in fact, limiting some of the choices uh, that you have available in terms of creating uh, styling for your web pages. We work very closely with you to select a look and a feel that, uh, that you like. And our goal is, is to help make sure that, that that is consistent and that people do use those things. 
uh, one of the things that's uh, becoming more important these days, and, and you're going to be hearing more about this as we move forward with uh, with our updates, uh, is that heading styles, these so-called these heading styles, which are in the, the the drop down in your WYSIWYG editor, are really intended to be helpers for organization, not necessarily styling. Styling is actually secondary. Uh, but they do tie together because organizationally the most important things have the perhaps boldest heading styles. So there is a hierarchical organization uh, to your pages. Um, you should, and I, we, you've heard this if you've ever been to, on any of our uh, training webinars, that you should never directly copy and paste content that is in it from a formatted source, whether that is uh, another website or Microsoft Word, uh, for the simple reason that uh, copying formatted text can basically break the styling that we help apply to your content. And uh, there are several tools uh, f for doing that. One of the simplest and easiest is taking that formatted text and running it through a basic text editor like in uh, Microsoft uh, Notepad or something like that. There are also some tools in your editor that you can use. Um, there is a copy, f copy and paste as text tool in the WYSIWYG editor. Uh, if you have uh, multiple content editors, uh, many of you are, uh, may have a, a larger organization and you do have multiple content editors, you might want to consider creating a style guide. A style guide would be a document uh, that informs your content editors about how to style text on your website, where to use uh, boldface, how to use headings, uh, how to use links, and so on and so forth. And uh, style guides can really run the gamut. We've, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in the corporate world, a style guide can cover everything from websites to business cards and stationery and everything else. And if you're uh, an organization that is doing a branding effort, uh, that's precisely the, the kind of a style guide you might want to think about developing. Uh, I'm just going to stay focused today on a style guide that you might want to use for your content editors that will help bring consistency across your website. And of course, um, keeping it fresh and updating it frequently. Uh, yes, it's a best practice. Uh, you want to give people a reason to keep coming back to your site. Moreover, when it comes to search engine rankings, um, the frequency with which a page gets updated is one of the factors that uh, uh, search engines will consider. How old is a page um, is a factor that will be considered when determining uh, page rankings in, let's say, Google Search. So some more, uh, and, and again, uh, some of these things are, are changing. Uh, you know, a lot of our sites, when they were originally built, uh, used fairly small fonts. And uh, what we're finding uh, these days is that, uh, especially on mobile devices, small fonts are even smaller. So you want to avoid using tiny fonts. And again, we can certainly have a conversation about making changes uh, to your site uh, to adjust font sizes and colors and so on and so forth. It's always a better idea to use real text as opposed to graphical images of text. And the reason for that is that graphical images uh, to a search robot, to uh, an indexing uh, tool, uh, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's a graphical image. Um, and unless you put a good description behind it, uh, you're not going to be able to search for that text. So also regarding uh, fonts, you want to make sure that there's good contrast with the background that that font is, is presented against. And uh, that's, uh, that, that's also a very important accessibility topic because uh, some of our visitors who are perhaps aging and uh, their arms aren't as short as they used to be, they need to, uh, their eyes aren't as good as they used to be, we need to make sure that, that the bold, that the text stands out. Also using lists, if you have lists on your site, Again, using the, the provided tools, the bullet list tool and the numbered list tool uh, is, is good from a variety of perspectives. It makes the site easier to browse. It has implications for accessibility and so on. Um, so 
there are many ways to make your content easier to understand. Uh, write clearly, use clear fonts and headings and lists appropriately. Uh, and again, uh, try to use your basic formatting tools, your bold, underlined, and italic for emphasizing text. It doesn't necessarily have to be much larger and of a different color to grab somebody's attention. And continuing along again, the headings discussion. And, and this, is, this is, again, something that is uh, changing and evolving. Uh, we are moving away from the notion of using uh, heading styles as formatting tools. The title text, for those of you who are routinely editing content, that is the H1. You probably don't see that very often because it's reserved. Uh, the, uh, it is intended to identify the content on the page, and the only content on your page that gets the H1 heading is the title, whether it's a block or a page title, by default it is set in the H1 format, um, and that's usually predefined. It has implications for search engine optimization because, the, again, the search robots look at these heading styles, and that's about the only clue they have about the organization of your page. So these heading styles, if you think of them in terms of, of an outline, of outline headings, uh, they should be conveying the structure of a page and ordering your content. I'm going to sound like a broken record on some of these, uh, but there's a good reason for that. So, uh, continuing along, let's talk just about the home page. And it's great to st stand back and, and try to get out of your head and be conscious of, of what a visitor might actually see when they load up your home page. Where do your eyes go when you first look at a page? Uh, and that can be very telling. And uh, feel free, you know, if you need to move things around or try some different things, that's okay. Uh, but you want to be conscious of where people's eyes are drawn. If people's eyes are drawn to a sidebar instead of your main content, um, that may not be such a good thing because the important stuff should be the main content, whether it's a home page or an interior page. Home pages are a little different because you try to present a variety of different pieces of content. And for that very reason, it's important to be brief. Your home page content blocks are there, and we actually call them teaser blocks. The goal is to tease your visitors into clicking through and learning more. So going to other pages in your website. That's the best way to present a lot of information on your home page, but still get people the whole, to the whole story. Um, slideshow images, uh, this is a mantra of mine. They need to be the same size and shape. If they are not, you'll see the border between, you may see the border between your slideshow and the home page blocks either jumping up and down, or you'll see a blank space between your slide. Uh, show and the content, and I've done several webinars. Uh, we will ha we have a document on our site that can help you with that, and uh, we'll actually be uploading a, pr a recording of a webinar I did recently on that very topic to help you out. Um, it's also great to, up to update your roller images periodically. Um, you know, they, they they should be fresh, just like content on any other page. Uh, if people see the same thing over and over again. Uh, it basically, it, it almost disappears from their view. So you want to keep those things fresh. Um, and in terms of roller images, there's a lot of different ways you can use them, and that's, that's a whole other discussion. Uh, on your interior pages, again, keep the most important information highly visible, easy to see, perhaps a, a, even at the top of the page. Um, again, consistency of the use of in text formatting and so on, keeping your page, your content fresh and up to date, and the readability uh, of your content. And readability covers uh, a lot of things. Um, you want to draw your visitor's eye to important content, but you don't need to hit them over the head with it, which is why the, the more subtle formatting tools such as bold, underline, and italics are very useful in that regard. They, they're more subtle than the heading styles, um, and you, while you wouldn't necessarily use them for organizational purposes, they're great tools for pulling, pulling attention. Uh, the other thing is, 
if you have a temp- if you have a temptation to create a, a have a block of text that is all in boldface, you've basically lost the use of that tool in that content. So if you feel like uh, things need to be fully bolded, uh, perhaps you need uh, a, a larger font, and, and uh, that's something uh, certainly we can talk about. Um, finally, don't be bashful about linking content on one page to content on another page. Uh, a website, a website is, is a web. It's not a book. It's not read sequentially. And additionally, it's always good to provide people with different ways to get to certain content. If content is related uh, on one portion of the site to another portion of the site, link them together right in the content. Uh, not everybody wants to go back into the menus to find another piece of the website that's referenced on a web page. So using, link, using links extensively is, is, is a good thing. It's what the web was all about. And talk a little bit about navigation and organization. So right off the bat, um, planning your navigation for your least savvy user. And again, those of us who are perhaps steeped in technology may have a different approach to this and a different way of thinking about uh, navigation. But uh, it's important that we consider our audience. Uh, in fact, uh, ask somebody who's unfamiliar with your site to try to find things and, and take that feedback. Um, you want to use broad terms. Uh, you want to make sure that the headings properly correlate with your content so that the visitor knows what they're getting into. Uh, at the same time, you have to keep those terms somewhat broad. Uh, for example, um, you may want to wish to, uh, let's see, if you have a, a link under your school's uh, menu that says other learning uh, or learning other than schools, why not make the main menu item learning instead of schools? Because learning encompasses schools, but it can also encompass a lot more. So those broad terms are important. Um, you want to keep your navigation consistent and simple and usable. And that means typically avoiding very deep menu structures. Um, Rarely should you need, you should never need more than three levels of navigation. And one of the reasons this is increasingly important, as I said before, is the uh, ubiquitous nature of browsing on mobile devices. Uh, Submenus that pop open uh, can be more and more difficult to navigate on a small touch screen than they are on a computer screen where you have a mouse. Um, so multiple multiple levels of menu um, can be can be a problem on mobile on mobile devices. Now there are some other options available to you on that. Uh, we can have a discussion uh, about creating. Uh, and in fact, as part of the responsive design of your site, uh, it's possible to do what's increasingly be called a so-called hamburger menu, where you have an icon on your site. Um, and that icon pops open a menu. Instead of uh, navigating th down through drop down after drop down. But again, you want to try to minimize. And there's always that balance of uh, uh, breadth versus depth. But you want to try to avoid using, long, using sentences as page titles. Uh, brevity with page titles, again, is, is also critical uh, for usability. Uh, for mobile environments, and uh, in, in general, uh, just f making your, your website simple. Um, in terms of when you create links, you want your links to be descriptive. And uh, click here, click here, as, as popular as click here is, it doesn't convey any real information. If you can, and, and, and this is an arena where you might want to again consider uh, you can have different colors, different styles for links on your website. Uh, originally, you know, a long ago, um, a link was defined by it being blue and underlined, and that was sort of the reserved style for links. Now that's changed quite a bit, uh, but it, it's important to, to, for your visitors to be able to, to distinguish between a link and ordinary text. 
And while click here certainly does that, uh, as I said before, it really doesn't convey much information. So um, again, if, if we move towards uh, changing the appearance of links, you know, obviously on, on monitors it's, it's more obvious because when your cursor is over a link, the cursor turns into a hand in most browsers. You don't have that luxury on a mobile site. So it needs to be easy to hit, easy to see, and there's nothing wrong with linking an entire sentence. Okay, a big target is much easier to hit. Again, especially on a mobile device, on a tiny screen. Uh, sometimes uh, you browse to a website on your mobile phone and a link that is only one word, if you have a fat finger, honestly, it can be tough to hit. A couple of other strategies include uh, anchor links for doing on-page navigation. If you have an exceptionally long page, which in fact is not all that great to begin with, but you can create anchor links which allow you to jump to particular spots on a web page and that is a tool that is included in your WYSIWYG editor. It allows the URL, a URL to include um, an anchor that will jump directly to a particular spot on a page. Um, again also related to that is the use of top links and uh, you've seen web pages which again a long web page may have a return to top link. And actually these are becoming more common uh, as we move towards mobile first design where there is more of an emphasis an emphasis on pages that are narrow and necessarily because they're narrow they get longer. Uh, but you want people to have an easy way to get back to the top of the page which is important. Pictures and graphics, uh, you want to make sure you use descriptive titles and descriptions. And as I said before, because a, uh, a search engine uh, cannot tell what's, what a picture is or what a picture is of, you want to use those tools in the image editor, uh, in the image, uh, in, in, excuse me, in the insert image tool uh, to make sure you have a descriptive title for that image. Additionally, as a, uh, that is an accessibility issue because those visitors who have perhaps visual impairments or are using software to browse uh, accessible, uh, accessibility software to browse your site, um, those tools require, depend upon those sort of under the covers descriptions of things like images. Uh, I think photos of empty rooms don't draw people in is, 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 is self-evident at one level. We all love uh, how beautiful our sanctuaries are and things like that, but images of empty rooms just don't engage people the way images of people engage people. Consider the scale of an image. Uh, if you're, again, putting an image on a page that's going to be seen on a small mobile device, if it's a, 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 an image of, of the entire synagogue from the outside, uh, the detail and the beauty of it just may not come through. So you want to consider the scale of the images that you're presenting, not try to present too much. Um, layout is, is, is an obvious thing to consider. You know, you have some options in that regard. You can uh, place your images, to your text to the left of your images. You can place your text to the right of images. Um, and uh, generally speaking, you don't want to zigzag too much. Uh, but again, think about where people's where people's eyes are drawn. Uh, I've already talked about avoiding the use of images as text. Uh, the problem here, as I say, is just like with text, uh, using images of text instead of text renders that image unsearchable. So uh, as much as we'd love to use uh, our PDF newsletters and, and just put them on the web page, many, many PDFs are little more than images. And we need to be aware of that. Um, they, a PDF that is just an image, there, you can create PDFs that actually contain text. So there are really two ways to do it. Uh, most of the free uh, PDF converters do little more than create an image and stuff it into a PDF container. That is not searchable. Uh, and and in, in fact, you probably have to put it up as an iframe 
So it, 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 it's not the greatest way to present content. Uh, one thing you can do is perhaps put a, create a teaser of the front page of your newsletter and let people click through to the PDF and have it display in a separate window or something like that. Um, and again, uh, if, if, if a, an image is linked, you want to give it a good description. Uh, media and iframes, uh, again, using appropriate headings or labels. Um, you should not, it is def decidedly not a, a best practice to autoplay media. Uh, and you've all, I'm sure, hit pages where uh, all of, you hit a page and a video starts running. Uh, and that can be very distracting uh, to a lot of people. And uh, in fact, that can just drive people to close the window altogether. So uh, it, it's a bad, pr it's not a good practice, certainly not a best practice to allow media, whether it's audio or video, to just start playing when, it hit, when you hit this page. Uh, if you have alternative presentations of media, um, that is a good from an accessibility perspective. Um, as, as I said, uh, YouTube now has uh, closed captioning options. Uh, sometimes they're pretty good, sometimes they're not. If you're using a third-party player, and this is, again, becoming increasingly important for, for another reason, uh, that there is a sea change coming to the Internet, and that is all of our content is getting secured. And uh, Google is, is largely behind this. They're calling for SSL everywhere, so that all of the traffic uh, that travels around uh, on the Internet is encrypted uh, f for good security reasons. And uh, honestly, probably the NSA can still get to it. But uh, if you're using a third-party player, uh, I would investigate if, and if not insist that that provider have a secure version. Uh, players that are not secure, some of you may have already experienced the problems uh, that, that are that we're encountering because players are not secure. And we're in the process, we're on board with this uh, uh, SSL everywhere principle uh, that websites should be secure. Um, and uh, the iframes, if you have an iframe of a player that comes from somewhere else and it's not secure, uh, we can work around that at some level. But in the long run, uh, all of these, all of these third-party uh, providers should be turning to secure content provision. Okay, forms. So, uh, you know, some of these, again, are self-evident. Your forms should be logically organized. Uh, and, and admittedly, that logically organized to one person isn't necessarily logically organized to another, but they do need to flow. They need to be easy to navigate. And uh, most, of, most of the forms that I see are pretty good at this. Um, you want to use simple and effective field descriptions. There's a, there's a little description field uh, when you create a web form component. And uh, some people use them extensively, some people don't. Uh, if, if there's any question uh, that a visitor might have about what a field is all about, it never hurts to put in that little description. Uh, field sets, too, should have some descriptive text associated with them. Um, and again, this is not only a, a, a usability issue, uh, it also is an accessibility issue. We use markup fields in our forms, and they provide you with the same WYSIWYG editor that you see in blocks and on pages and so on. And you should be following the same rules, the same consistency, the same use of Heading style, headings and uh, styles that you use elsewhere on your site because this is another piece of being consistent. And finally, your donation pages. They need to be more than just cash registers. Um, research is, is, is showing that you need to tell stories. It, it's, you, know, you can have a web page uh, that is linked to a donation form, and that's one way to do it, but the donation form is a web page and it should be just as engaging and it can have the same content that your other donation page has. You may want to open it up in an, in, you may want to have a donation form that opens in a new window and that's fine, but take advantage of the fact that you have 
that WYSIWYG editor and that your donation form is, is another opportunity for you to tell a story. Uh, it should be whether you're telling a story, uh, whether it's a call to action, uh, whether you're trying to reach out and, and touch people emotionally. You can do that on your web forms. Okay, so um, that's pretty much the end of uh, what I had to say today. What I'm going to do uh, is open up the conference for a little Q&A. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come across the chat line, so let me open it up here. So we are in conversation mode. I can hear you. Uh, if you're in a noisy environment, um, actually, let me see. Start for it. If you have a, uh, a speakerphone and you're in a noisy environment, uh, I would ask that perhaps if you're not ready to ask a question that you mute your phone. Uh, most of your speaker phones have a mute button of some sort, uh, just so that it doesn't interfere Why with uh, with the conversation out here. And uh, I'll open it up. Does anybody have oh. any specific questions that we can address for you? Oh no, she doesn't care. Are you kidding? I well, it's, it's pretty quiet out there. If that be that being the case, um, again, you certainly can uh, contest, contact us directly if you have specific questions. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to know what you think. Um, how can we make these presentations better? Did you get some good learnings out of this? Uh, and is there any way we can help you out? So uh, with that, I will say thank you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and uh, perhaps in our next J Village Learn webinar. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye.